I'm doing great, Alexia. Excellent. We're just, um, okay, let me mention to some I haven't admitted yet, and we will just begin now. Okay. Okay, perfect. I think we're all in here. Okay, well, hi, everyone, and welcome to our CEO talk on how to run a successful worldwide company in the education market. My name is Alexia Sanchez, and I'm the EdTech Director for U.S. and Canada at Cypher Learning, and your host for this live session. Today, we are joined by a very special guest, Graham Glass. Graham is the CEO and founder of Cypher Learning, a company that specializes in providing learning platforms for organizations around the world. Graham has had many years of experience working in the education, corporate training, and computer technology fields. As well, he was a senior lecturer at the University of Texas, wrote several books about his work, and has given many speeches on educational topics at conferences around the world. In this session, Graham will share with us his experiences so far in running a worldwide company, his tips on being a successful CEO, and his thoughts on the current trends that are shaping the EdTech market. We will also have a question and answer section at the end of our session. So make sure to prepare your questions for Graham and post them in the chat area when it's time to do so. Okay, so, well, I'm sure that a lot of people will like to know what it's like being the CEO of a company that has not one, but three products. Are there any useful tips that you can share with the audience on what it takes to run a company and what is your idea of success, Graham? Yeah, that's actually a great, great question. And um, one of the things that when I first uh, founded Cypher Learning is because I had a, a background in both higher education and in business, I was really in, interested in creating a product that would address both of those markets partly because of personal satisfaction and partly because there, there's a lot of revenue to be made. And, uh, but it's not easy. If you're going to have um, different products and different market segments, you really need to think, figure out very carefully how do you create a single code base that addresses all the markets? Because you don't want to have three engineering teams, three marketing teams, three sales teams. It would be very difficult. So quite early on, we figured out a way to create a single product that could address those markets with various configurations. But one of the interesting things is, is that when we were initially looking for potentially getting venture funding, they all told us you should not do that. And they would actually say, if we're gonna fund you, you have to get rid of Neo or you have to get rid of Matrix or one of those products. And so fortunately, I just turned down that funding because I didn't think it was a very uh, good decision. Um, so it's not easy, but we've achieved it. We're getting awards and recognition for um, in both market segments, but it was definitely not easy. Um, and I would say, you know, as far as definition of success, I mean, there's different ones. There's obviously financial success. You want the company to keep on growing, to keep on becoming more profitable, but there's also personal satisfaction. And I'm definitely passionate about education. This is a, a a labor of love for me just as much as it is a business. So I would say I'd be feeling very satisfied to see large numbers of people all over the world using our products in schools, universities, and businesses. Okay, well, that sounds great. And it is, um, I believe that it is very admirable that you know how to discern in deciding and choosing um, what are your objectives. And in this case, you wanted to go into the three fields um, you wanted to get into the entrepreneurs. You wanted also to reach to schools, plus also businesses and trainings. And congratulations on that, Graham. Thank you. Okay. So um, how do you see the current education and corporate training market? What are the most important trends to follow now? Well, I, I really do think that the future of education is going to be personalized competency-based learning. And I'll tell you a little bit about what I, what I mean by that. Um, and I'll use it as an example, there's a, a school called Knowledge Schools in Sweden that does this. So when a, a student goes to Knowledge Schools, instead of saying you're going to take one period of math, one period of French, one period of biology with everybody else, what they say is, what are your interests? What are your educational goals? And they decide the, the strengths and weaknesses of the student. And then they might say, well, in your particular case, for this semester, we're going to focus more on biology and chemistry and history. Once they've made that determination, 
All of the educational modules for those subjects are available online and the student can take them at their own pace. They don't even have to go to the physical school to take those modules and learn them. And when they feel like they're good enough, they can go along and they can have these competencies measured. And as long as they've achieved a certain level of mastery, you can kind of check off that particular prerequisite and they go to the next module. So what they've done at knowledge schools is to say, here are the competencies that you're going to get. We don't actually care how you get good at those things, but we're going to measure them. So at least we can make sure that, you know, you're, you're meeting your particular requirements. So I think if you take that concept and then just apply it to education uniformly, I think we're going to have platforms like Neo and Matrix that you're going to be able to tell the platforms, here are the competencies that I want to achieve. The platform will start making recommendations in conjunction with your, your teachers. It's not like I think teachers are going to go away. And as they, and you can measure your own competency and move forward at your own pace. So I think that's inevitable. You know, there might be a few details that are slightly different, but I think education is going to break away from everybody taking the same material at the same time in these 40 to 60 minute chunks. And I do, and although there's a lot of talk about AI, um, I think I don't think you need AI to achieve this. However, I do think that machine learning will allow these platforms to become a lot smarter about their recommendations for how to achieve certain competencies. And Cypher Learning, we're going to be infusing all of our products with machine learning before the end of the year to do exactly that. So obviously, there's other trends going on in terms of yeah, use of videos, et cetera. But I do think that the biggest trend is a move towards personalized competency-based learning. Yeah, I, and I do agree with that. So tell me, um, there are many of... Um people out there and teachers and especially directors, principals of uh, schools that they are a little bit afraid of how to apply or how to integrate with uh, our competencies and our skills. How can we do it um, using our tools? Yeah, and that's a great question because there are a lot of schools where competency-based learning is a brand new thing. Um, and, you know, we're actually working with a large school district where they want to ultimately move everything towards, towards competency-based learning, where there are no longer any courses at all in their entire district. That's like the future goal. Uh, and, you know, that has been achieved on very, very small scale, but not on a large district level. However, I think they're doing a very sensible thing, which they're saying, we're going to set up, get a few specialists, a few teachers, we're going to do a few pilot projects with competencies. We're not going to do away with courses, but we're going to take the materials in the courses that exist. We're gonna figure out which competencies, which certain exercises or materials correspond to. And we're gonna get the, the instructors used to the idea of measuring the competencies and perhaps giving students rewards or gamification points, et cetera, based on those competencies. And once they've had success and get comfortable doing that within a individual course, then those teachers can become evangelists and start training the other teachers. And ultimately, when more and more courses become competency oriented, then they're going to be able to start saying, well, maybe this group of kids aren't going to go to regular courses anymore and become a bit more like knowledge schools. So I do think there are some very practical incremental ways to use, for example, our, our fantastic support for competency based learning but still doing it within the context of a few courses, a few pilot projects. But at least though, I do think it's important for those directors to have a kind of a, a future state in mind. Uh, and it's not science fiction. Like I say, the, the knowledge schools in Sweden have been doing this for 10 plus years with a great success. So it can be done. It's just something you have to kind of get comfortable with. Okay. And is this something that it is just focused on uh, schools or can we also apply these skills um, into the, um, into the trainings? Well, I do think that in, in businesses, competency-based learning is, is actually more advanced than it is in schools and universities. So for example, in Australia, where we've got a sales office, uh, take a look at something like the Australian Water Board. So if you want, want to get certified by the Australian Water Board, you have to show mastery in over 1,000 competencies. Oh, wow. uh, and it has to be traceable. So you can say, I got my certification and this competency, I demonstrated mastery in this course and this competency, I can demonstrate mastery from 
maybe somebody graded me on that, et cetera. And one of the nice things about our business product matrix is not only can you tag the individual assessments and the individual modules with competencies, but we also provide the, the, a holistic view of a particular learner and all of their competencies independently of which particular courses um, that they achieve them. So there are a lot of certifications in industry which are actually competency-based, you know, uh, naturally. I think the other thing as well, there's a definite trend towards what some people call learning experience, um, where let's just say that you have a particular role at a company. Like you might be junior marketing manager, but you want to become senior marketing manager. So it's entirely possible to have job titles with associated competencies where you to be able to sit down at the platform, evaluate your current competencies and say, yep, I am fully skilled to do the junior role. Now, what's a gap analysis between what I have now and the competencies I need to begin senior? And then based on that gap, have that platform start making recommendations on how to kind of raise, raise the level of your, uh, your uh, career potential. So there is a lot of work going on right now in the world of business of using competency-based learning to, to allow people to progress through their careers at their own pace. Yes, and, and that is great. That is great. I do believe that people can acquire um, more skills using these kind of features from the LMSs and that it is also uh, another trend. It's also about being more um, personalizing and customizing the learner for each company, for each learner. So uh, tell me, Graham, you were also talking about gamification. Um, what, are your, what is your vision towards gamification in the future? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I have to say gamification kind of took me by surprise. So a little, little bit of background. So this is about four years ago because we've had gamification in our system for a long time now. And, uh, and I was reading about it and thinking, well, it sounds a little bit, you know, touchy feely. Is anyone really going to use gamification? Um, especially, I thought, well, if if anyone's going to use games, it's going to be young kids because adults is too, you know, is too uh, juvenile. Let's just say. Mm -hmm. But what we did is that we added gamification, and we did it in quite a cool way, where we we have a layer, a, a, um, a feature set called automation in our platform, where you can specify when a certain condition occurs, trigger. A set of actions and those actions can be give you a certificate they could be give you a congratulations so we integrated gamification with automation so you can set up rules that will give people points and badges when they achieve certain things so the interesting thing is by far the biggest enthusiasts of gamification were customers in matrix which is for businesses so it seemed like adults in the workplace are the ones that actually get the biggest boost out of gamification. Um, perhaps it's a generational thing, perhaps maybe it makes their workplace environment more fun, but they were the ones who first adopted it rapidly, followed by universities, followed by children. Oh, so, wow. the, so the audience that I thought would be the most enthusiastic was actually the least enthusiastic about gamification. Um, that's just a little side note. So it's been a very, very popular feature. And so in terms of the future of gamification, um, I mentioned, you know, we're one of the few platforms that actually uses automation to drive gamification. So already in our platform, you can do very cool things. You can say when you finish module three and you're located in California, then automatically give you this special California customized batch. And now what we find in Matrix is people want to start giving actual real financial rewards. So for example, in Matrix, we've got a very nice e-commerce system with the concept of coupons. And with a coupon, you can say, this coupon gives you 20% off a certain set of courses. So we've integrated the e-commerce system with our gamification system. So you can have a rule that says, if when you get to the end of this course, automatically give them a badge and give them a coupon for 20% off. So that's kind of like, I think we're probably the only system that actually allows you to do that. But, but I can definitely see taking this thing to a whole nother level, which is what we're planning on doing later on this year. So you can do things like give badges that automatically correspond to certain industry standards. So you can use them for certification processes. Or when you get a badge, automatically share it to Facebook. So all of your friends can see that you got that badge. And if they click the badge, 
it'll tell them how they can achieve the same award. So I think really it's not so much the idea of points and badges that will change that much. It's what you do with them and how you share them and how they will actually count towards, you know, real life uh, rewards. Well, that is great. I had never heard about that idea, becoming them, um, the rewards becoming uh, financial rewards. And I think that it motivates more um, all of the, the workers <laughs> to, to continue the progress in the platform. Okay, so tell me, Graham, how are you being able to see and to take these advantages and these opportunities in the market? How are you able to, to look at them and find them? Um, well, you know, partly it's based on my own experience as an educator. So uh, it wasn't that long ago that I, I literally taught, I think, over a thousand people uh, when I was a, a trainer. And uh, so I've already got, I've got a kind of a feel for what, what someone running a course or wanted to educate people um, would like. But I also I still remember vividly what it was like to be a kid sitting in my classroom at uh, high school in the UK thinking about all the things that I would like to be able to do, which I couldn't um, at that time. So part of it is driven by a lot of my personal experience, my own goals. Uh, I do read a lot. So I've always got a good idea of what's going on in the industry. We go to a lot of trade shows like IST and ATD later on this year. Uh, and then there's also some futuristic things. You know, one of the things I will say is I've got a pretty good uh, instinct for Where, for where things are going, regardless about whether people agree with me or not. So um, I think that, um, you know, combining all of these things um, together holistically allows me to have a pretty good idea about what's going to happen. And then the tricky part is, is that what order do you release those features? Because some companies release very futuristic features, but don't cover the ones that are necessary right now to close deals and they go out of business. Some companies are fo so focused on the present that they get left behind and then more nimble companies um, trample them. So, of course, the tricky thing is always to get the right blend between the futuristic and the, you know, the practical. Okay, excellent. So um, we would say that it would be reading a lot, um, hear about uh, trend, uh, trends, and also try to find a middle point between the present needs and the future needs. Thank you very much, Graham. So tell me, how would you define um, success? Well, we, we covered that a little bit earlier, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. you know, the, you know, financial success and personal success. Um, I would say a few more things though about the, the company. So uh, one of the things early on is that I did approach venture capitalists. I kind of told them our vision. But as I mentioned, a lot of the venture capitalists would say, well, you have to get rid of one of your products. You know, we, we don't like you being multi-product. Or they would say, you have to focus on just the United States. Whereas in fact, we've got 10 offices around the world. We're used in 100 countries. We support 40 languages. They didn't like that at all, but I was absolutely determined that we were going to be a global company. So I would say in terms of the company, it, you know, my plan is to stay independent and do an IPO. So I don't see any reason right now um, why that's not going to happen. I think that's actually going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, so rather than 10 offices, I would like to have 40 offices. And uh, I definitely would like to, to become a public independent company. And like I say, I'm, I'm, we're quite lucky that we, we did not take any venture funding. We're self-funded and we're profitable. So we have avoided a lot of those compromises or restrictions that otherwise we would have uh, had imposed upon us. Well, that is great. And um... So your vision would be growing more the company. And uh, do you have any other points for what is your vision for the company in the next uh, few years? Well, certainly, if you have a look at our feature set, it's already very comprehensive. And a lot of those features are relatively everyday. Yep, it's practical kind of feature. But my, one of my goals is to channel more and more of our engineering department into much more futuristic R&D. So I would say within a year, I'd be happier if 30 to 40% of our engineering team was focused on integrating with virtual reality systems, a lot more AI, a lot more uh, machine learning. Um, and uh, because we've covered so many of the everyday features now, there's a, there's a certain point where you really have to start raising the bar. And one of the things that we do as a company is we try and find customers 
who have that same desire to move into the future. Um, and fortunately, we have found already some customers. I mentioned that school district that wants to move 100% to competency-based learning. And that's very exciting. That's very exciting for me, for the company. And also, I think that it will definitely raise our, the awareness of us as an innovator, as opposed to just having a great LMS. Okay, great. Well, I think that many of us in here are uh, intrigued on what you do in your daily routine. Any tips on, um, on doing something that could uh, lead us into a successful career? Yeah, that's so one of the things I'll mention is that there are different kinds of CEOs. So there are some CEOs that come from a, a sales background. They're like the sales CEO. And a typical sales CEO will offload most of engineering to somebody else. Um, and they will run the sales department and they spend a lot of time thinking about sales strategies. There's also marketing CEOs, which are somewhat similar. I'm definitely a product CEO. So what that means is my background is in technology, building award-winning product, um, products, you know, pushing the engineering team. That's kind of my focus. So I've got really good sales and marketing heads who do a lot of the sales and marketing work. But I would say at least 80% of my day is focused on the product itself. And within that day, some of it's everyday stuff like, you know, when are we going to release this feature? What's the status of a particular feature? But I would say 20% of the day is me sitting down in a coffee shop, relaxing with a piece of paper, sketching out, here's what we should be doing in Q3. Here's the industry strand. Here's what I'd like to be doing in 2020. So that there's always a short, medium and term roadmap um, in my mind. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely a product CEO. So a lot of my time is spent on the evolution uh, of the product. But for example, you know, one, here's just one interesting tidbit. So, you know, the LMS is the law is the most um, revenue rich product you can have in the education market. After that, you have products like what they call LXP learning experience platform which is what I alluded to earlier, which is helping people move through career paths. And so a pretty big decision for me is, uh, is Cypher Learning going to release an LXP product to complement our LMS product? That's a non-trivial question because it involves engineering, marketing, branding, revenue, et cetera, et cetera. But recently we decided, yes, we are going to be releasing an LXP product. So there is going to be a matrix LXP. That took quite a lot of brain cycles trying to figure out what do we do about that new emerging uh, product category. Well, that is very exciting. Any other, um, any other releases that we should know about? Well, I mean, there's always cool features coming out. For example, one of the things, and this is not some super fu futuristic concept, but we're really a big fan of decomposing user interfaces into widgets so that you can rearrange the dashboard, rearrange your main grid, rearrange your course landing pages, uh, upload your own widgets, have widgets that integrate into the ad hoc reporting system, et cetera. And so next week we're gonna be releasing version one of our widgets, widget system. Um, and after then we're gonna be releasing quite a few variants on that. So widgets is an example of something which is not mind blowing, it's not futuristic, but it's really flexible. And that's something that I spend quite a lot of time working with my engineering team on, uh, on figuring out. So that's just a short term feature that's coming out very soon. Yeah, and I've heard that many people are really uh, looking forward to see this widget feature. And um, I, I do believe that uh, one of the key factors of uh, why Cypher Learning is so successful, it is because you are, as a leader, really open to listen from suggestions from the, from the clients. So uh, tell me, what do you value the most about our culture and vision as a company? Yeah, that's actually a great point because a lot of our best features are ones that have happened because of a customer saying, well, we would like X. And then our engineering team works with them and say, well, if we, if we abstract this, we might be able to create feature Y that does X, but also a lot of other cool things. And uh, so, yeah, certainly talking with our customers daily really helps to open our eyes to new things. So I would say we definitely, as far as company culture goes, it's not something which has a master plan, but I would say internally, we're all pretty friendly. So I like to hire happy people, friendly people, people easy to get along with. 
So that just makes your job more fun. And when people are friendly and open and happy, they just tend to talk more and you know, they're not afraid to share ideas. Um, and that also creates a certain tone of voice for our customer. There are some companies that are very corporate speak in the website. We try to be smart and friendly, I guess would be my kind of way of summarizing it. But in terms of encouraging that kind of interaction with our customers, we have a lot of open dialogue in our support forums and our suggestions area. So anytime somebody has a suggestion for a future, they just click in a box, type in their suggestion. We always look at these suggestions every quarter. We always publish our roadmap so our customers can see exactly what we're working on, when they're released, when they're in testing. And uh, it's not uncommon for us to have a pretty constructive dialogue uh, almost on a daily basis with, with a few customers about certain directions they, they want to see the platform. Okay, excellent. And I have also a, um, a question. Um, there has been many people that say, well, you know, it's, it's Sunday. I don't want to go back into the office on Monday. So uh, tell me, what is motivating or what makes you um, get up and just love going into your office and start working? Well, this has actually been something from when I was four years old, or maybe maybe even earlier, I don't remember. I've always been project oriented. I've always loved building things. I have never not been building something. And uh, so it's really just a question about what it is I'm building at any given time in my life. And I absolutely love the Cypher Learning platform. I love, so the actual platform itself is a, a great project. I like building Cypher Learning, the company, which is another project and uh, so I've never had any problem whatsoever going to work I just absolutely love you know doing what I'm doing and I think that um, the, the people who work in cypher learning have a very similar kind of sense they usually you know they're really proud of what cypher learning does they love working with customers they're very excited about every time there's a new feature for example I I chat with our sales department so maybe once a month I have a chat with all the offices around the world and I give them a a personal guided tour through the last 20 features that we added. And it's just very exciting and happy. So absolutely no problem with motivation at all. Okay, perfect. Well, that's great. So um, tell me um, about how, um, like working in this industry, why did you like e-learning? How come you chose uh, this industry? Yeah, well, so, you know, when I was a kid, I loved my high school. I loved education. I used to think I want to be a teacher. And then ultimately I did become a teacher. So when I was doing my computer science graduate work at University of Texas at Dallas, they asked me whether I wanted to be a teacher there, an instructor. So I, I taught maybe a thousand people at UT Dallas, all kinds of computer science. And I really liked it. It was just so interesting, so much fun. But I do remember I got really good at teaching a subject called Unix. And in those days, they didn't really have LMSs like Neo or Matrix, where I could package everything that I learned and make it available to potentially millions of people who might pay me for my knowledge. So I, I remember as an instructor thinking, this is very inefficient way of teaching. I have to physically repeat myself every semester to a small group of people. Why can't I package this thing up in a scalable way and make it available to millions of people? So that always kind of stuck in my mind. And I did a couple of other companies that were pure technology companies where I learned a lot about how to build advanced software. But ultimately, I was drawn back to my educational roots because I just do think there is a better way to teach and learn. So a lot of it is really just about having a, a bigger impact on the way that people learn. And it's becoming more and more important these days with the rise of automation, with AI getting smarter and smarter. Humans are going to have to learn more efficiently in order to be able to contribute to you know, the, the, the global future. So hopefully some of the work we're doing in Cypher Learning will allow people to teach and learn more efficiently, which in turn will actually just help, uh, help the earth. Yes, and I believe that you are right in that. So um, tell me, what other threats or opportunities are you seeing in this or foreseeing for this business? Oh, Cypher Learning? Um, well, I tend to concentrate much more on opportunities than threats. It's actually, uh, it's actually a common entrepreneur error to focus too much on what the comp competition has done. Because if you look at the e-learning 
opportunity. It's a massive, it's like $10 billion, $15 billion space just for the LMS. So as long as your product just keeps on getting better and better and better, you are just naturally going to grow regardless of what your competitors are doing. So I don't really worry too much about threats. I would say in terms of opportunities, I'm really glad that Cypher Learning went global early on because there's so much opportunity, especially in places like Mexico, Philippines, Brazil, Chile, Peru, uh, India, China, etc. And I've never, re I, I, I come from a family of adventurers and travelers. So uh, I would say, you know, one of the biggest opportunities is not being too blinkered by focusing on the US or, you know, Western Europe. Um, and honestly, more than half of our revenue already comes outside of those regions. So this is not a future vision. This is something that really just happened in our past. But I would say recognizing the growth opportunities around the world is actually one of the most exciting things. So as I mentioned, we've got about 10 offices around the world. And if things go well, we'll probably have 20 offices by the end of this year. So um, it's going pretty good. Okay, excellent. Well, we have a question from Jose. Um, he's asking, um, what, what is the vision that you have of the e-learning in five to 10 years? How do you uh, foresee the future of e-learning? Well, I definitely think that uh, machine learning and AI is going to play a really big part of it. So I think the platforms are going to get smarter. They're going to understand your strengths and weaknesses. They're going to be making more recommendations. Um, and so definitely a lot more proactive recommendations from the platforms is, is one. Uh, definitely more modular just-in-time learning. So one of, the, one of the issues that people talk about is, I go to my high school, I learned something when I was 13 years old, maybe I don't need it until I'm 23 years old and then I've forgotten it all. So I think there's gonna be a movement toward just-in-time learning so that I might have, you know, here's my iPhone and I happen to be on vacation and I need to learn something quickly. I go in and I type in what I wanna learn and then the platform says, okay, here's, a, here's the top three videos for learning this, and here's the competencies that you'll learn, and maybe you can self-examine at the end of that. So I think moving towards learning stuff now, just in case I might need to need it in the future, will slowly get replaced by, I wanna learn something now, what's the fastest way to, to learn right now? And, and that's part of the, the trend towards lifelong learning, rather than I learn all this stuff really early on, crammed it into university and high school, and then I kind of float around during my career. I think those two areas are going to be definitely become um, kind of blurred together. Thank you very much, Graham. And I also have a question from Alina. Um, she would like to know uh, what is one thing that you would like to change about the current education system? Uh, one thing I would like to change. Um, I, I'm a really big believer in self-paced. So forget about even competency-based learning. I, I have a very, very mem uh, two vivid memories from my own childhood. There was one where I went to a, a school in Te Tehran in Iran. So I used to live there when I was little. My dad was there on business. And they actually had a school whereby if you, if you got really good at, say, science, then they would just automatically, in the middle of the semester, allow you to go to the next level up. So I went to this school where I really enjoyed science. So I was leveling up and going through courses. Then I came back to the UK and went to a school that didn't do that. And it was really pretty depressing. Uh, I just felt like I wasted a lot of time not going anywhere because I was just stuck in this course and I knew all the stuff already. Um, and so I've experienced moving at your own pace and I've experienced being stuck. And I think any way to allow kids to move faster so they don't get bored, so they're more challenged, is definitely something that I would like to see more emphasis on. Um, in school systems. More interactive, more dynamics, right? Yeah, and more self-paced. I'll give you a low-tech example of this. So when I went to the school in the UK, in the math class, they used this series of books called Alpha Books and Beta Books. And these books were designed for self-paced. So they would have a little exercise, then some questions, then a quiz, then some more exercises. So if you were the kind of quick, uh, kid that could learn stuff quickly, you might get stuck and you raise your hand and the teacher helps you, but you could literally go as fast as you want. So me and one of my friends, we had this competition to see how quickly can we go. And so we were like 
two books ahead of everybody else in the course. And during the, the summer semester, I asked the teacher, can you give the next book to my mum so I can continue to go through the summer so I could beat this other kid? <laughs> Um, but for me, it was really good fun. It didn't involve technology. There was no computer systems. It was literally create books that were more designed to be standalone and self-paced. And then the teachers in the classroom would basically be more mentors and doing ad hoc lessons when the kids needed them. More as a leadership uh, role of the teacher, right? Well, the, you know, the, the standard way of doing the teacher would the teacher would stand up, they would give a lecture, to everyone at the same time. So if you already knew the material, the lecture was boring. If you were far mm -hmm. behind, you'd get confused in the lecture. So it's more like taking the teacher from the role of delivering content on a set schedule to taking their skills, making them available on a timely basis to those kids who need them, but allowing kids to go at their own pace if they don't necessarily need those lectures. Okay, I see. And I also have a private question it says um what are your three biggest accomplishments my three biggest accomplishments being a dad <laughs> <laughs> yes i've got a young son that i'm extremely proud of and that was probably one of the best things in my life um i would say you know in terms of just mental mental fortitude um, i've been at some previous companies where things were not going well where i had a very uh, bad chemistry with um another person in the executive team who happened to be the CEO at the time. And one of the things I would say about me is that I have never, ever given up. Um, so in that particular case, I thought the company is kind of doomed and I left the company, which was the right thing to do. And literally the next day I started my next company. So oh, rather, wow. rather than, uh, Oh my goodness, it's, things are so terrible. I need to give up. What have I done? I was just so confident in, what I wanted to do the next day I started my next company, which was a success. It was a really award-winning company. I ended up selling that to a company called Web Methods. So I would say I've definitely gained um, a lot in terms of like not giving up. Um, in terms of my third accomplishment, let me just quickly think. Uh, I'm sure that that I'm already, accomplishment will, will be- I, I would say, I, actually my third biggest compliment I'm really happy with the music I've written. So that one of my biggest hobbies is writing music and I'm actually quite happy with some of the songs I did. So that's probably, probably my third, third well, main. Congratulations. And I'm sure that your second accomplishment will be um, such an admirable thing that your son will learn from this. So congratulations. I hope so. I hope okay. so. so I have another question. What, what other CEOs do you look up to? Uh, definitely Richard Branson. So that oh, really yes. is one of my heroes. I actually named my son Branson, by the way. <laughs> so, oh, wow. uh, not just because I admire him. And I would say, you know, as far as Richard Branson goes, the thing I admire about the guy is he's really smart. He's fun loving. Like I can, I've never actually personally met him. I hope to one day, but he seems like he's figured out a way to grow businesses, help the world and have fun, which is not really yeah. a, uh, a, an easy thing to do. Obviously, Steve Jobs, uh, you know, unfortunately, he's not here anymore. But the thing with Steve Jobs, he cared so much about elegance and the user experience. And he was a very hard taskmaster and he created beautiful products. And definitely Elon Musk. Elon Musk is like, he's like barely oh, yeah. human, that guy. It's just an unbelievable level of intelligence. But the same thing, he doesn't give up. He he'll go to absolutely the wire and he does not give up. And the fact that he's blowing, you know, the, the roof of the space industry and the car industry and everything else is just unbelievable. So I would say Richard Branson, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk are my kind of top three. Yes, and uh, once I heard that somebody described him as uh, bringing the future into the present for Elon Musk. So yeah. yes, I, I do admire him. So. Absolutely, it's incredible. Okay, so I have also a private question. It says, um, how would someone write about your life for a magazine or a newspaper? Write about my life? Yes. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not that exciting. Um, you know, I think, I think they would kind of go through a little bit about my life story. I've lived in some very interesting places. Um, I've, I've been involved in quite a few different kinds of projects. 
but you know, my hope is that the best is still to come. So uh, I want to take Cypher Island to another level where there's a bit more to write about. Okay, perfect. Oh, I have another question from Alfie. Um, he wants to know what is the biggest challenge and how did you address that challenge? Oh, the biggest challenge. Um, I would say, you know, the biggest challenge in the early days was funding. So I had very ambitious plans at Cypher Learning. I had this three product strategy on a single platform going global, you know, 40 languages, 100 countries, all of these things I wanted to do. But unfortunately, when I did talk with venture capitalists, they were not that enthusiastic about that um, because they generally will not believe that you can do that. And so, and so unfortunately, it was one of those ones that in the early days, I ended up funding the company myself out of my own pocket, um, which is totally fine, just makes life a little bit harder personally. So, but you know, now we, we've, we've basically proven the strategy works. We are now actually global. We have three successful products. They're growing very quickly. At this point, we don't actually need venture capital anymore. So that, that kind of time has um, come and gone. But I do think in the early days, it, it was difficult because when you are bootstrapping a company, you can't afford to hire 100 people. You know? So you grow more slowly. You have to be very, very focused about the, the features that you released. But on reflection, it was totally worth it because now we've got the financial freedom. We can do whatever we want. We're going to be doing hopefully an IPO in the not, not too distant future. But at that time, though, that was probably the hardest thing to, to deal with. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, I have another private question. It says, um, what was your journey like to get where you are? Well, I, I covered a little bit about that earlier. Um, I think, you know, get, having a, an enjoyable childhood, having some very good teachers gave me an idea of what was possible. I think teaching at college gave me a very good sense of teaching in a higher ed style environment. Um, I think then doing, going through the, the series of companies that I've done prior to Cypher Learning taught me a lot in terms of how to run a company, financial, you know, being careful with finances, how to hire people, um, corporate messaging, the importance of engineering, architecture, all of those things kind of got accumulated um, through, through that. Obviously, you're always learning. So I would say, for example, one of my weaknesses right now is I do not travel enough. Um, so one of, one of the things that I have on my to-do list is to visit more of our customers around the world. We have sales teams on the ground that visit them regularly. So it's not like no one's visiting them, but I think I could probably benefit from doing a bit more international travel at this point in my, in, in my life. Okay. Thank you very much. And, um, um, can you tell me a little bit about the communication between you and the other levels in the company, inside the company? Yeah, so, um, so one of, you know, we use a, a variety of tools for our internal communication because there are a lot of us and we're all around the world in different time zones. So there's a few things that we do. There are things that we do daily, things that we do monthly, and then things that we do less often. So on a daily basis, I always talk with my CTO, my head of marketing, and my sales minimum every day. So we're always on the same page. We already always know that, you know, the, the, the top level things that are going on tactically. Um, in addition, if there are certain key features that I'm involved with, I will talk with the engineers that are involved in those. Or if there are certain key things going into marketing, I might talk with specific people in marketing on a daily basis. And this is happening throughout the company. Like the head of sales will talk with their sales team daily. Head of marketing will talk with a lot of their team uh, daily. But that's kind of like the, the daily routine. So I feel like I'm talking with a lot of people every day. Then what we do is that when we release new features, probably every month, I will give a presentation company-wide, typically to all the salespeople and some of the people in marketing, and then give them a guided tour with, here's the next release of the product, and here are all the cool new features. Here is how you can position them to the customers so they understand the value of these particular features. We also do a lot of trade shows. So we do some small, small regional trade shows. We might do a small one in Australia or a small one in Chile. And in those smaller ones, we'll usually have the sales team from that particular area, the educational technology team from that area, and maybe the head of marketing or the head of sales will visit that particular event. So you start to kind of um, 
uh, you start to get people from around the world going to these uh, smaller events. But then we do quite a lot of large events. So we've got ATD coming out in Washington this year. In, in, we've got big ISTE conference in Philadelphia. We have the BET conference in London. At those shows, we normally have eight to 10 people that we even invite some of our support staff to come along because we want the support staff to see here are the end customers, here are, here's what trade shows like. So we use the trade shows as a way to also move people around and get them to all meet each other. So I would say we use a blend of different techniques, which are daily, monthly, and then yearly to make sure that everyone globally gets to communicate in, in different ways. Yes, and I can see that because you're also communicating your values, your vision, your strategies to all of the employees. Um, I've also heard that um, most employees are really happy and really um, satisfied with, uh, with working for, for Cypher Learning. Is there any tip or any suggestion on how are you um, getting all this satisfaction from the, from the, the employees working for you? Yeah, I, I think there's a few things. Um, so first of all, you know, we want to hire people who are really enthusiastic about education, you know, um, because if someone's not that enthusiastic there, yeah, they might be able to build a product or might be able to sell it, but the, the passion doesn't come across. And so, for example, our head of sales is like one of the most passionate people I know. He loves education space. He loves what we're doing in this space. He loves the product. And so when you've got the, the heads of the departments who are really into this, they in, in turn want to hire people who work for them. They are also excited and passionate about it because otherwise it's kind of a bummer if you're really excited and the people who work for you are not excited. So I would say having very passionate people at the top of the company who then hire other people who are passionate makes a big difference. Um, I would say also, you know, I've, one of the things that I've done, which is not that common, is I've been very open with the financials of our company with, with our employee base. So we'll say, you know, here's the monthly revenue, here's a target for next month, here's the yearly target, here's what we need to do in order to achieve an IPO. Um, so everyone's got a pretty good idea of that things are going well. Um, every single person who works for the company has stock options so that when we do an IPO, they will get an additional bonus effectively for contributing to Cypher Learning. So I think it's a combination of passionate about education, really enjoying the product. I mean, the product is something that we have a lot to be proud of. It's really fun to, to use, combined with a financial stability, like I'm working for a company that's doing good and my stock options will be worth something pretty good, hopefully re reasonably soon. I think that combination of things is probably accounts for it. Okay, excellent. And besides um, hiring people who are really passionate about education and about the product and uh, people that are really um, willing to, to work uh, with a happy attitude, what other thing would you say that the company culture it, it can be described with? Um, I would say, you know, far, pretty fast moving in the sense that and this is somewhat similar to, I guess, Tesla. If you look at Tesla, they keep on releasing features quite quickly. Yes. I'm, I'm personally somewhat addicted to speed, not the drug, <laughs> the, okay. the, the fast pace. <laughs> Just don't want that to be misconstrued. Um, so, you know, I start feeling emotionally uncomfortable if we haven't released a cool feature in a particular week, as an example. So I have a certain internal expectation that things are gonna move quite quickly. And I try to project that to everyone in the company as well. So every time I chat with the CTO, the head of sales, the head of marketing, the expectation is, is that things are moving quite quickly. Um, and, I would, and I want to underscore innovation as well. It's like, I think one of the reasons that it's quite fun to use our product um, is because there is a lot of innovation and, it's, and the innovations are coming out quite quickly. That's another thing about our company that I... I try to promote, which is we are very interested in the future of education. Uh, I do think that some of our competitors, they, they don't really innovate that much. They might do well in terms of financials. They might sell a lot of their product. But, but when, I, when I think about them, I don't think about a company that necessarily has a few, big future vision for education. So I would say 
fast moving and innovative are definitely two values that you know I try to promote. Okay, excellent. And um, I would like to know what would you like to um, to have the society to have the the world. Um, what would you like to give back to to them? To the world. Yes. Um, that's actually a really, really interesting question because there are things related to cipher learning and there are things that are outside of cipher learning. So I would say, you know, within cipher learning, um, obviously I just want to make it much easier for people to, to teach and learn. Um, and so by having, you know, I don't know how many would be great, like a hundred million people on cipher learning products, teaching and learning and improving their life, you know, that would be very rewarding in terms of the company itself. Um, outside of the company, I'm really passionate about helping animals. And so one wow. of the things that I have in the back of my mind is um, a, a way, I would like to create a little uh, educate, uh, sorry, a charitable foundation that I would fund to try and promote um, animal welfare around the world. Uh, and very specifically, if you, if you have a look at how a lot of animals are kept and raised and killed, a lot of them are pretty dismal. I mean, I've seen pictures of chickens stuck in these little cages oh, or yeah. pigs, and it's like really disgusting. Yeah, like so, the ones for the nuggets. <laughs> yeah, so I would like to promote a concept that if you are going to keep animals for the purposes of research or food, then you would have to have a webcam that opens everything to the public so the public can actually check for themselves how the animals are being raised and slaughtered so that they can make an educated decision about whether they want to do business with you or not. So, uh, so that would be, that's one of the things that I've definitely thought a lot about. Kind of being and a responsible, I'm sorry, sorry kind of being like a responsible consumer, right? Yeah. And, and making, making it a law so that you actually have to open it up so the public can, can see what's going on. Um, so that's something I would be very proud of. And I, I definitely have concrete plans to do that sometime in the next couple of years. Oh, well, please let us know because I'm sure that uh, many of us will like to try to help and join into this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I have this uh, last question. Um, it says, what is your approach to motivating and developing talent? Um, well, I think, I think, you know, I like to hire people who are somewhat self-motivated, honestly. So I don't really feel like it's, uh, part of my job to help people be motivated. Um, that, that being said though, I think, you know, hopefully we've created a nice culture in cipher learning where if you're in engineering, you're motivated because you do a nice job and then it's available to millions of people the next week. I think that's pretty motivating. And to, um, to be part of creating a product that's helping a lot of people, I think it's quite motivating. And the same thing is true in sales and marketing. I think that if you close a big deal that allows half a million um, children in a developing country to learn better. Yeah, you get a sales commission, which is nice and your stock options are worth more. But I also think that knowing when you go to bed that you're going to help half a million kids use an innovative project is pretty, pretty motivating. So I think it's more like try and hire people who are self motivated, but at the same time, give them a platform so that when they do close a deal or they do market the product, they can see that millions of people are positively affected. Okay, excellent. And um, any question, uh, any last question for Graham, uh, please be sure to write it down and we can ask it. Um, Graham, uh, any suggestions or tips for all of us who are joining in today? Uh, I would just say if you are interested in cipher learning, then definitely <laughs> You know, check out our website periodically. We have a lot of social media stuff going on in LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, which has lots and lots of updates. If you want to come and visit, visit me at ATD or RST or some of the rest of the team, then you're obviously welcome to join us. Um, so I would say, you know, if you, if you like what we're doing, then, then follow the company on social media and you'll, you'll get to learn a lot more about us. Okay, well, great. Um, it seems that nobody has another question. So um, I would like to finally um, thank you very much, Graham, for joining us here. And also um, all of you, thank you. We will be sharing uh, the link for the, for, for the recording of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. It was my pleasure. And thanks a lot, Alexia. You were a great host. 
Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Very nice chatting with you. Bye. Bye-bye.